Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks on imaging and observing. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty and the field of astronomy. Uh, today is September 29th, 2023. I have no idea where the year went, and I'm sure you feel the exact same way. Um, but before we get started, uh, if you want to support the channel, please subscribe, leave a like on a video, lets us know we're doing a good job and that we should continue, uh, keep this endeavor going. Um, if you want to support the channel as well, you can head over to skywatcher.threadless.com, pick up some cool swag that goes with your Skywatcher hardware, and represent but all that goes to supporting the channel there so we definitely appreciate everyone there who's uh, been helpful and we hope you're enjoying your stuff so um today we actually have our friends trevor and ash from astro backyard there they are hi <laughs> good morning guys i guess it's is it morning there or is it afternoon now okay we just it's only 10 here so um, so today we're talking about Ontario Star Fest, which I wasn't able to go this year. I had some family stuff come up. All is fine. Just wasn't able to go. Um, but you guys have gone two years in a row now. Um, and our team was there. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed us being there, but we thought it'd be cool to do an overview episode of some of the cool things about this event. Um, so I don't know if you guys could kind of tell us a little bit about Ontario. Wait, hold on. There we go. There they are. I didn't hit the transition button, so I was talking to myself. Um, you're welcome. There they are. Um, so, and their fleet of equipment behind them. So, uh, so anyway, uh, if you guys don't know who Trevor and Ashley are, they're part of Astro Backyard, and you probably live under a rock, and you should go over to their YouTube channel and check it out if you're not familiar with them, but I'm sure most of you are. So, anyway, Ontario Starfest. Uh it's kind of your local thing, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's a really great star party. So two years in a row now, and what I think's pretty cool about it is that it's a, not a far drive from Toronto, so a major airport. So we found that there was not only a lot of people from all over Ontario that come to this event, but even people <laughs> from the states flew up, uh, and from other parts of Canada as well. So. It is a Bortle 3 dark sky spot site, so suitable for a star party, but still pretty accessible for, for a big group of people. So I think that's why one of the reasons it's so successful and so busy. Yeah, and I think what's also kind of interesting about it, so the event happens in uh, typically August around new moon, and it takes place at um, a private campground. They have kind of a agreement with the private campground to host Starfest each year. And there are seasonal cottages there um, who are under an agreement to abide by the star party rules for the week of Starfest, which I think is pretty neat. Um, and so because it's a private campground, there's tons of great facilities um, in the park, like really great shower facilities, some indoor speaking um, spaces, plus a large outdoor tent um, for additional uh, larger speaking engagements. So just lots of really good stuff on the grounds in terms of facilities and that you don't always get at a really remote type of star party. Yeah. Yeah. Because you guys went to, you came with us to Texas, which was pretty, that's I think pretty comfortable for such an event. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you've been to Okie Tex, which I haven't gone. And I understand that's fairly remote out there. Um, I don't know where you guys stayed during that one, but a lot of people just camp or RV it because there's not a town. So yeah. no, yeah, we stayed right in the small town. I think there's last we heard 20 people living in the small town of Kenton, which is where we stayed. Um, they had sort of like one of those long mobile homes set up that we stayed in, but otherwise, yeah, if you're not if you're not camping, there's not a lot of other places to stay for Okie Tex, which makes it a bit tricky. And that's kind of I know you guys have, if anybody's watched your channel, you guys have your your little trailer that you haul around to some of these events. So it's nice to kind of be able where it's close enough to where you can actually bring it. So Yeah, we can bring more stuff when we don't have to get on a plane too. So mm -hmm. that's always nice. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, it was a little limiting at Texas. So, um, so that's really cool. That's a Bortle three site. So it's not obviously the darkest skies in the world, but I usually think anything under like Bortle four is, it's particularly for the imager is, you're good to go. Yeah, there were a few people there that were like, uh, I'm like, isn't this great, Bortle three? They're like, oh, it's Bortle two at home. Like they're in these like really <laughs> small parts of of Ontario, more north than us. Uh, but yeah, for anyone that's in the greater Toronto area or us in down in Niagara, Bortle three is is worth the drive all day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially considering how close you guys are actually to like New York City. It's not that far. Mm -hmm. um, from New York at that point. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw a light dome from New York city from, from there, probably in the Southeast, I would take it. Yep. Southeast. Yep. And that's where from this park, that's where the light dome from Toronto is too. <laughs> so, um, that's the worst spot of the sky, but again, um, you know, it's low and it's a dim glow, but really when you take a long exposure photo, that's when you really, that's when you really find out what the light, where the light domes are. Um, but yeah, really great skies. And the, the cool thing about this party is that it always happens around the Perseid meteor shower, like second week of August, which yeah, is such a is great the... time of the summer because you get the Milky Way core is still up when it gets dark out. You get, you know, Sagittarius, all that great stuff. And then when that sets, Andromeda is coming up and then it's not, it's, you know, 2 a.m. and you've got Taurus and everything too. So it's kind of a transitional time of year, which is really nice. That's awesome. Um, Ash, I know you're really big on um, like IDA and preserving the night sky and stuff like that. Do you find that that's a really good event to kind of share that, especially in the local like Canadian region? Yeah, I think a lot of people understand the issue a lot, especially at the star party, because a lot of people are from, um, I think it's the North York Astronomical Society or Association that puts on the star party. So a lot of these people in and around the Toronto area really understand how bad light pollution gets. Um, so yeah, you have a lot of kind of allies at that type of event that understand the problem. Um, one of the unique situations though is, is even though um, the permanent residents at the campground deal with um, the star party and, and, you know, trying to turn out their lights and things like that, you do get some instances of people uh, maybe not, you know, forgetting to turn out a light or somebody driving around in their golf cart or something. So there's little parts of the star party because you're dealing with that type of environment of other people who live there year round. So that's kind of in a unique situation, but for the most part, people, people get it. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think your favorite thing is having gone two years in a row? What's your favorite aspect about Starfest? Uh, it stood out to me having gone to a few different star parties organized by all these different groups. Uh, the, the staff and the organizers for this party seem to go above and beyond. And where you really see that is they have this astrophotography image competition and people get so excited about it. Like it's their highlight of their year for some of these people. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the people we hung out with had entered their image images in this competition. And uh, they go all out with this thing, and it's under the main tent, you know, on the la on the on the last oh, night at like eight o'clock. And there's like you know hundreds of people watching this event, and uh, they make custom trophies for each category. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only is there prizes and stuff, and I know Skywatcher uh, donated a bunch of gear for prizes, but like they make these custom little trophies and yeah. um, that kind of stuff, where it's like they really care about making this event special and memorable for people. Yeah, that's awesome. I know my boss, Jeff, and uh, our marketing uh, guy, Jared, was there and got to hang out with you guys, but they brought home yes. one of those little things and they're adorable. It was How like much... a, a movable little refractor telescope on their on, trophy. Like, yeah, I think yeah. it was a mini EQ6. Too. Yeah, handmade, yep. hand painted, like they're adorable. Really cute. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's I I didn't get to go, but I helped with a lot of the prep. And it kind of blew me away how proactive that group actually is on the back side of things. Cause the most people attending don't see the organizational side of things, but months in advance, we had meetings with them and it was just incredibly well organized. Um, at least from what I saw and I heard, had heard nothing but positive things from our team who went 
about how well organized and the attendance is great and the people who are there are great. And it's just, um, my understanding is it's been put on the docket for the Skywatcher crew as a yearly rotation for the time being. So hopefully next year we will be there. That's great. I yeah, hope you I guys will they, be there. It's like all hands on deck. It seems like they have a lot of hands from their astronomy group or volunteers otherwise that help with the star party. And uh, so, yeah, that usually makes things run nice and smooth, which is great. It's yep. also nice to meet some of the um, like fellow Canadian astrophotographers, too, because we do attend a lot of star parties in the United States. So being close to home, it's like some of our you know fellow Canucks. It's nice to connect with them and, and see them year over year, too. No, it's, I talk about Grand Canyon all the time. I know I talked to Trevor about Grand Canyon yesterday, <laughs> but it's it's cool when you have a large event that's kind of your home turf and it just kind of feels like yours. And I think you kind of try to hold on to that and support it because these events are very rare in the grand scheme of things. And to have one a couple hours from home is a major plus where you don't have to you know, go through all these crazy logistics to get somewhere at that point yeah. yeah and and for new people that come once you've been there a few times you almost feel like you're playing that host role of saying like oh this is this is how this works this is where you want to be and this is what time the cafe closes and it's fun to play host for for new people visiting to make sure they have a great time mm -hmm. that's awesome uh, that actually is a good segue what would you recommend for someone attending starfest for the first time or even their first star party um who Hey, I've only observed her image from my backyard because it's a little bit of a different mm -hmm. logistical planning experience when you're going out even an hour from home. Yeah. My advice would be, and I'm all about this, so that's probably why it's coming for me, but like make a checklist of all the things that you need to bring because the last thing you want to do is leave something behind that you absolutely need to run your entire setup. It's always um, the USB cable I, <laughs> or the counterweight or, yeah. or the power cable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We've had, there was one of we, each of those issues at Starfest this year. So, and, and you feel so helpless for uh, someone. There was a guy, I was like, can anyone get this guy an EQ6 counterweight? Like, <laughs> someone on this field has an extra EQ6 counterweight. We just need to find him. Yeah. I don't know if he ever did or not, but yeah. So checklist is important. <laughs> Bring extras of things and go with your setup that is like reliable. The one that gets you through night after night. Don't try something new at Starfest or a star party. Go with like the tried and true. Yeah, it, it's almost like I have like warnings more than preparations. And it's like, once it gets dark out, you better have everything ready because there's no white light. You can't go searching around in your car for things. So get everything set while there's still some light out. Do your polar alignment at dusk. Because once the lights go out, that's it, right? You don't want to get stuck in that situation. And uh, I think beginners that are used to being a, in their backyard and everything, where they, they've got the light on, they're going into the house to find things they forgot to bring out. Like, no, once the party starts, you, you better be ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the same. I'm not sure how hardcore Starfest is compared to like Texas Star Party, but... <laughs> Texas is pretty hardcore. If you flip a white light on there's a good chance you might be buried in the dirt of Texas at that point. But yeah, everyone's usually very nice, but you get some choice words <laughs> from yeah. astronomers. There's some yelling or screaming. Turn off yeah. the light. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're a beginner, just bring a red light. Um, we've been to events before where literally had people bring their telescope and unbox it at the star party. And we've had some of our team have to sit there and basically walk them through. It's like, don't, don't be that person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> For your own sanity, don't be that person. Yeah. Like, as I've kind of told people, it's Trevor, you've been in bands before. And uh, Ash, I know you've competed with things where it's like you practice and practice at home. And then when you go to the star party, that's kind of like your big show. Yeah. It's like, that's where you execute everything you've screwed up at home and then apply it at those events. <laughs> yeah, there's there's an etiquette to it that you know you have to understand going in and where you could say like, oh, how could someone get so mad? It's just a white light temporarily, but these people have traveled for, you know, hours 
to get to this special place to enjoy the night sky. That's why they're there. So it's it's kind of rude, even though you, you didn't mean to, to disrupt that because that's why we're there. And it's the same with, you know, you can help people to an extent, but people are there to observe and to image themselves too. So you need to keep that in mind and realize that time is precious and there's very limited time you get under those pristine skies. Yeah, and there's people, you know, just applying what I've, you know, done at Texas and Grand Canyon and other star parties. There's people who save up all year. Like that is their big thing. So, you know, if they lose a night or I find every astronomer is usually very welcoming and stuff, but to an extent, you'll eventually cross that line where you kind of wear your welcome out where it's like, I want to help you. But again, I'm here to do these things. Mm -hmm. So mm. make sure you know your stuff. If you have problems, people are always willing to help you, but no one's going to stop and blow their whole night to help you learn how to align. So figure it out at home and then take it. Or if it doesn't work, don't bring it. <clears throat> or just set your like expectations accordingly for yourself and maybe mm -hmm. just going in for like a learning experience just hey if i get set up and running that's great but if i don't you know there's i can look at this beautiful sky you know with binoculars or just my eyes you know that kind of thing yeah and and just have those conversations during the day get and and then mm -hmm. you'll know going into the night what to expect and to not expect someone to walk you through the entire process stop what they're doing and help you then get it done during the day because yeah yeah there's there's usually plenty of people out at a star party for the most part during the day particularly in that mid-afternoon where they're just bored mm -hmm. and looking for something to do yeah that's usually a really good time to be like hey i need to collimate this or my especially like cable management or something like that that's the time to go mess around with all your stuff and ash i know you kind of applied this you kind of kept your setup really simple because you were using that new little scope I think you've got from uh, Steve and you just kind of kept it as this little wide field easy to go set up kind of rig and you killed it with some of your images from there oh, too thanks yeah I just because we were bringing a lot of other stuff too like the, you know the camper weighs a lot we bring water you know we brought our 14 inch sky watcher dog like we may us. or may not have monopolized <laughs> some of that room but, so. um, <clears throat> it's just sometimes it's just nice and easy and and to keep it to keep it light to keep it functional but not overdo it so that was kind of yeah i used the starfield gear 60 this year first time using it first time also using an autofocuser yeah. um at the event Whoa. i i didn't follow my own advice of trying something new at a star party but <laughs> Don't um, do all of these things. <laughs> I did all of these things. <laughs> well, the autofocuser, the with the ASI Air, the the their version of their autofocuser, the little red box. You're like, okay, so how do I use this thing? I was like, okay, start autofocus. Done. Okay, like that was it. That's yeah. all you do. Like, yeah. Yeah. So you're a wizard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's a question here for someone who has only done backyard astro imaging what would be a good first star party to try out it kind of depends on your location the closest honestly. one to you yeah yeah i mean obviously location's huge but if you're anywhere near us which probably aren't like cherry springs is one that we love to go to in pennsylvania it takes us about the same amount of time to get there to go south to that party as it does to go to Starfest mm -hmm. in in ontario but yeah, with any if you if you can find a star party within four or five hour drive, consider yourself lucky because some people have to go much further or have to fly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, if there's no big events, uh, I probably recommend finding your local astronomy club. There's got to be one somewhere. And a lot of times they have monthly dark sky member star parties. It may not be the darkest sky in the world, but they're generally a lot better than your backyard. Um and that's a good way to, I know several clubs here in Arizona that have monthly outings and then they have usually in the fall and the spring when the weather is nicer, um, they have some larger, dark, really dark events that are a couple hours out of town, but they make it like a two or three day event. But yeah, check with your local clubs uh, if you need something small. And then if you want like a big one, um, You'll just have to look at your location. I'm not sure where you're at, but, you know, like for Trevor and Ash, it's, you know, Ontario Starfest 
for me, it's like Grand Canyon Star Party, which is a little different animal because it's an outreach event. But um, or like I said, Texas and Okie Tex, there's a lot of people in the middle of the country who trek nine or ten hours across the Midwest to do that event. So whatever is close to you. Yeah, that's great advice, though, starting with your local, local astronomy, astronomy club, because then you kind of get a taste of what it's like to be away from your backyard. It's almost like that bridges the gap between your backyard and like a full blown star party. It's kind of that middle ground. You get to learn some lessons there, maybe bounce some advice off your um, fellow astronomy club members. And yeah. then you're laughing. Another good one I would, and I know you guys have done this a couple times is if you don't really know if you want to go to an event, you could find like, a darker spot that maybe has like an Airbnb or a campsite. Um, I would say if you go to a campsite or an Airbnb, you need to be very understanding that just because it's dark doesn't mean everyone else is going to follow that etiquette where the star parties kind of have that etiquette applied. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, like having your own mini star party. So that's one of our favorite things to do is just to use the light pollution map combined with Airbnb to find these little places in the middle of nowhere, and then we can set up. But even then, we have to talk to the host beforehand, say, do you have power that we can run an extension cord? Are you okay with us setting up a telescope? Maybe and being, filming a video. Yeah, and being outside all night, outside the property. Cause yeah, you wanna make sure all of that, you know, is figured out beforehand. Or is there a giant spot, like a <laughs> outdoor light that's gonna be on all night that we don't know about, but yeah. I always thought it'd be cool because I've done a couple of them here and I've done that where someone goes and stays and you do these different Airbnbs and then there's like a website for astronomers where it's like a write up where it's like, hey, we stayed at this Airbnb and the dark sky site is only 10 minutes down the road or this Airbnb is there's one in Oracle, um, which is about 45 minutes from downtown north of downtown Tucson that I like going to. It's Bortle 3 right outside the front door and i just throw some extension cables out there and put the tent and it's kind of tucked back in there and the lady who owns it's really nice and there's like three bedrooms and then you just go inside when it's cold because it gets cold and it's like this secluded hideaway um that's really cool um but you can see the milky way from the driveway Mm -hmm. that's a it's a that's a great idea for a group of people too. like get four or five people together and split the cost and rent out this cabin and uh, man not a bad way to spend a weekend if you ask me Mm -hmm. yeah but yeah those mini star parties are probably a good way if you've got like a close group of friends um and then that way it's a little bit more relaxed so if yeah a light goes off or whatever it's not the end of the world it's your friends um but those are good like practice events where you can screw up and try things. And then when you go to the big events, it's kind of like your Super Bowl, if you will, where <laughs> this is where you apply it all. So, yeah. um, where's Rudy? He's right. He's, he's right lying. here. You can almost see him. I, oh, I didn't even realize he was there. He's yeah, chilling right there. Sleeping. Post- the life of a dog. So. Um, to a remote star party, bring cash, not just because you want to buy and sell thing. You might need to actually money for showers, laundry, and if you don't prepay to get in. That's not a bad idea. Um, bad idea. Someone in the comments. Mm-hmm. There's Because there's usually a, a swap meet component to these star parties, which is a great place to, to find used gear. Mm-hmm. Uh, selection is always, you never know what you're going to get. But the swap meet at Starfest was really, it was, it was very busy. Yeah. Things got, if Text. you didn't go early, like things got bought up quick. Texas Star Party does that too. And it's always early in the morning, which blows my mind because it's like, we were all up till three (laughs) and you want us up at nine to have. uh, But I do think it's kind of cool because I've noticed on the used market lately, it's been really obnoxious to sell stuff. Just, I don't, people aren't buying or they want stuff for nothing. But uh, some star yeah some star parties do i didn't realize they had one but those swap meets are nice because you a get to meet someone b you get to see whatever you're interested right in person and it's so much easier to feel like you're getting someone genuine rather than this big you know email transaction and shipping and stuff like that on shipping yeah but yeah something fun Mm -hmm. um 
How was the wildfire smoke during Starfest this year? I know there's been I stuff. I think up there. it was there, but not as bad as it had been. But I think it was still affecting the sky quality. Um, but yeah, that was close. July was really bad for smoke for us, and then August it, it got a little bit better. So yeah, it was still there, but not as bad as it could have been. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, there's a bunch of little questions for you guys. Um, when doing astrophotography, doing star parties, do you bounce around? Oh, this is actually a good, this is a good question. When doing astrophotography during star parties, do you bounce around targets two to three hours each or just find one and pour all your time onto it? <laughs> I mean, even on a regular night in the backyard, it's hard to not say, okay, I got three hours. I could also get three hours on this too. get two targets in one night. Um, obviously the, 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 the right answer or the uh, responsible answer is to stick to one target, uh, not only for one night, but the entire star party. So if you get three nights, do three, three awesome nights on one target, that's what really what you should do. But because it is darker skies. So if you're used to a Bortle eight at home and you go to a Bortle three, you get two hours, something from a Bortle three and it looks pretty darn good. So mm -hmm. you can get away with, you know, hopping around to two or three targets. Uh, mm -hmm. if you get the chance and I totally understand why you want to make the most of your trip, especially if it's been, you know, a year where you didn't really get to do much imaging, mm -hmm. you want to make it count while you're there. So, or if you happen to go further South to a star party and there's new targets that you oh, don't yeah. have when you're at home. So like when we went to Texas star party, I shot three Southern or Daniel. four, I think you shot four targets and I've processed one. <laughs> that was actually cool that night because Trevor was hitting the pinwheel and ash was doing the, the southern pinwheel and the scopes were like this. yeah yeah <laughs> <It's like clears throat> yeah and i have video of you guys through the night vision doing that yeah. like, it's pretty neat and yeah. of course that was the night trevor shot the supernova like the day after we found out about it so yeah that mm -hmm. was made for a, a memorable trip yeah so um uh, some of these are stretching out uh away from the um topic but they're you guys are popular so um any plans to rebuild your observatory probably not in not anytime soon so the the dome as we had at the black dog observatory at the last house is not going straight up here in this backyard we still have it it's still in storage but expect some news on that front of of kind of pivoting from that um, that's not to say that we'll never have a sky shed pod or an observatory, but at least not right now in this backyard, just because with the garage door situation, it's just, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Uh, it really hurt. That decision was tough to make too, because that we totally planned to didn't even get full 12 months of the black dog <laughs> observatory. It's yeah. all that work pouring concrete. Like there is a, there's a concrete pillar in the ground of that backyard mm -hmm. for the new owners. Whether they like it or not, that's how serious and permanent we we thought it was going to be. But yeah, what observatories are quite changes. a commitment. So. It really is, right? It really. You is. don't think about it. It's like building a small house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that I know uh, our mutual friend Nico is building one. He just sunk two piers in, so mm -hmm. he's doing that's... it right, and he has a great location for it too. He's yeah, a, he's a Bortle three where it's like, oh, that's going to be so awesome. But Nico. Not to spin it off a little but Nico is the one guy who really, like, if you watch his videos, they are extremely in-depth, usually comparisons. He almost needs an observatory to just allow him to make the content that he does for that repetitive baseline that he needs for that kind of stuff. Yeah, and just knowing him and that level of, um, you know, planning that goes into everything, you can imagine how, he's, how great this observatory is going to be. <laughs> yep. Um, I know this kind of goes back to that topic of, you know, targets and your recent video, Trevor, you are going after a little bit more elusive targets. Um, but what are your thoughts about going to star parties and shooting something that is probably fairly easy? We'll say any of the Messier targets to something that's a lot more difficult, like dark nebulas and, you know, these not even because your shot that you just did with the Wolf Riot, while an elusive target is actually pretty obtainable with the correct filters from town, where you have other targets that are really, you know, faint that dark is the only way to do it. 
Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's kind of like my number one piece of advice over the, uh, you know, being ready before dark is do something that you just can't do from home. And usually that's something in broadband, uh, like a dark nebula or a galaxy that you need dark skies for. You can't get away with doing it from a bright sky with narrow band filters, anything like that. So go after the projects that need dark skies to, to accomplish. For me at Starfest, that was the Ghost Nebula in Cepheus. That was a yep, I really that's a good, that's a good I, one. I always <laughs> wanted to do that one. Um, in you know, Ashley's heart and soul was with no filter. So it's you see a lot of these heart and soul nebula pictures that were you know a narrow band or a Hubble palette or something that are great. But she did just the natural star color, so you get really that diversity of star color. But yeah, a lot of the um, dark nebulae and anything really dusty. Um, literally the entire constellation of Cepheus. Yeah, so, <laughs> totally. So. Yeah. There's a ton in there. I, I just know I, you know, I've imaged alongside you guys now and it, it's so hard not to be like, what's the Triffid look like? What's the lagoon look like? What's this one look like? And it's like, how quick can I do a shot? Because it's so bright out here, but it, it's hard. And then this might be another thing that you're going through because you are trying to get these more elusive targets. Um, for your channel and stuff like that, where it takes probably a lot more time of research to dig and find, because these catalogs are not like, oh, Messier or NGC. They take a little bit more effort to dig up, so. Yeah, I know, and I know you're really into the more obscure targets, so, you know, you're a source of uh, information for me, at least, for, for that kind of stuff, but, um, you know, Going down that road is one of my favorite things about astrophotography. You know, a lot of people say like, I've been at this for 12 years. How could I still be interested in it or get excited about it? It's because there's endless different avenues to take for sources of, you know, to get excited about something and to know that there's all these targets that I've never shot before that I've never even heard of and reading up on them. It's kind of like, it's like the ultimate game of like collecting objects and you want to keep adding to your collection so knowing that there's all these new ones that you've never seen before is exciting so yeah i was thinking of pokemon yeah you got to collect pokemon. them all right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah because you have the mezier catalog which is 110 objects then you have the ngc catalog which is about six thousand to eight thousand targets but that's between northern and southern hemisphere yeah and then you have ic which encompasses the entire mezier and ngc's and then you get into the really strange ones like Barnard, which are all dark nebula, um, LDN, uh, LBN, Sharpless, um, which Sharpless, Sharpless are a little tricky because you can actually get away with the narrow band stuff. I'm big on Sharpless right now. That's what I'm yeah. just going through the Sharpless catalog. Um, but yeah, those LDN and LBN, it's the Lynn Bright Nebula and Lynn Dark Nebulas. Those are you get some really dusty, dirty targets that yes. need a ton of luminance essentially to back it. Um, and a lot of time. Um, and then you get to weird catalogs like the, the Palomar clusters, um, and just these elusive, uh, but what I've actually noticed the best way, if you're looking for off the beaten path stuff is go find the guys who have the really big jobs or ladies. Cause I've met, a woman who has a 30 inch and she just kills it. Um, go ask them what they're tracking down visually and then take that information and go back to your catalogs and look it up because they're probably going after just something stupid. So <laughs> yeah, that, that type of visual observer is going deep into the catalogs too. Yeah. That's a great, great advice there. Um, what was your favorite? What were your favorite talks of Starfest? So. I, <laughs> I'd like to, Wayne Parker, uh, who <laughs> owns Skyshed Pod and is also a bass player for Glass Tiger, he had a pretty great talk of showing that not only the history of astrophotography and how much it's changed, because he's been doing it for, what, 20, 20 years, at least 25 years, but the history of Starfest. So there's all these pictures from like the late 80s uh, with all the old cars out on the field and the old like Celestron C8 scopes and stuff. So mm -hmm. it was, I love looking back at the history of this niche hobby and just you know capturing these moments and stuff so his talk mm -hmm. stood out for me yeah i mean and i know jeff wasn't planning on speaking but he took over your talk yeah um starfest but he did a great job 
And it was really interesting seeing some of the projects that Scott Watcher has worked on, like all the way up until it just didn't happen. Like it was just scrapped. So yeah, we unveiled some pretty secret projects in that. And there was some conversations like, do we? Yeah. So, but we had to dig through some stuff. There was, and we did that presentation on the webcast a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, there was a lot of stuff that we kind of showcased that I didn't think would ever, ever be talked about publicly. So you're welcome. That's cool. So that's like... very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So for anyone watching that doesn't know what this talk was about, it was talking about product development from from Skywatcher. And it was you should have seen all the products that got so close to being ready and available to the public, but they didn't something was missing where it wasn't you know, the, you know, you just couldn't get it right. Or just, it was an idea that didn't work, but like all this work and marketing and they get so close to being a real product, but just didn't make it. It was really cool seeing that stuff. Really interesting. And one of the talks that I think we didn't get to see that we were both regretting that we didn't get to see was Fred Espinex talk. Oh, I know. Oh yeah. Photographing the eclipse eclipse. master. I think it was one of the earlier talks in the day, which was a little unfortunate because I, because we missed it for that reason, because I think it was at like 10 a.m. Like it was early after a night of imaging and we just didn't get there. Well, I think you did another one too. We missed that too. It's just so the, it, it, it's so hard to do everything at the star parties. But yeah, to hear Mr. Eclipse himself tell you how to photograph a solar eclipse, you pay attention. Mm-hmm. But we got to meet him. So yeah. That was super cool. And yeah. we got to, it was cool that to he was there. chat for a little bit afterwards. So that was nice. Nice. Mm-hmm. Um. Here's a, this is a good one. Cause I know I've done it and it, it's not fun. Any experience in running multiple rigs on one night on your own? Do you have the resist the temptation to make sure your one rig works perfectly or you go YOLO and do a good spray and pray? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So the, I found that it, it is possible with, to run two rigs successfully. If you try to do more, cause I've tried to do three, you're, you're just spreading yourself too thin that doesn't work um you know oftentimes it'll be the two of us with two rigs so that makes it much more manageable two rigs are running two people that works um but yeah you you can think you can have everything already and everything planned out but um something always goes wrong with one of the rigs so yeah oh yeah yeah Uh, exactly you're you're almost insured something's not gonna work and then you're sitting there while your other rig is idle or whatever. So mm-hmm. we image with a guy. Uh, he's usually pretty close to us at Cherry Springs. Oh, he uh, successfully runs four rigs at a time at Cherry Springs, and he's there for like a week. It's he's insane. a different animal though. He's a like he's a planner like I've never seen before. He has spreadsheets for absolutely everything. Everything's itemized. The exact amount of time he's going to put on each target. All the scopes move at the same t- like he's different yeah, it's pretty incredible <laughs> to see him work <laughs> i'm i don't even know him and i'm already stressed out with the thought of that it's because i remember when we were at texas star party and we thought we had everything dialed and there was like a cable missing which completely threw off one of the rigs we had to switch everything around and you're pulling crap from other stuff and cases and trying to make it work yeah. Four yep. is that's... just like, oh my, and that's just great. We got him set up. There was an now you got to do it, wasn't it, for the the spring yeah. hundred? The one out. ring, yeah, is what messed the whole thing up. All and it I takes. S- <laughs> I swore it was in there, and it wasn't. So I ruined Ashley's shot. <laughs> that's not true. No, we just had to switch scopes. Yeah. Yeah, it was all good. Yeah. Hot potato. I'd use an Esprit 150. Uh, yeah. Darn. I'd use a 120. Darn. <laughs> uh, let's see. What do you think of the new Astrophoto rigs like the Sea Star S50 and the Dwarf 2? Pretty. Uh, so, in a nutshell, they're they're better than I thought they were going to be. Uh, the only one we've experienced like that was the <coughs> Stellina, mm-hmm. which was very cool. The way it worked, it's like, there's no way this is going to work. No polar alignment, no nothing. Plate solves, live stacks images, really cool. The Dwarf seems to do that equally as well. And I know it's a lot more affordable than that Stellina that we used was. So it's more, you know, obtainable for most people. Sea Star looks gr- really great too. I've been seeing stuff pop up. The stuff that it can do with the sun 
you know, kind of plop it down, have the solar filter on, on there. What do you know? You're taking pictures of the sun. So, and again, at a, like a lower price point yeah. than we've ever seen before. So I hate to use the term game changer again, but I think it's going to get a lot of the non-technical people into our world. And if they want more, then they'll, they'll, they'll hopefully watch mm -hmm. our stuff and start, you know, going deep. Yeah. <laughs> or just like the outreach component. I know that gets yeah. talked about a lot when you talk about these particular types of devices and just being able to show people in real time, the stacking, what you're looking at, finding it in the sky, using their, you know, sky tools and that kind of thing. It's, it's neat. Mm -hmm. Definitely think there's a niche for them. Yeah. Not um, for everybody, but they're definitely. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I don't expect any high caliber imagers to go backwards, but I wouldn't mind playing with an S50 C star just because I like playing with telescopes. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see what one of them does, mm -hmm. but I could see, because I remember getting started and it's like, we spent all this money and I had a C8 with a Hyperstar and a cheap camera and you had to make sure everything worked and hope to God you got something where these now it's like you pop it down, put the app on and off to the races. Yeah. I mean, like for certain scenarios, it makes a lot of sense. I know they get a lot of hate from the, you know, traditionalists and stuff, but like we have a 10 year old nephew, like for Christmas, it's like, if he was really into us, into astronomy, we could get him one of those kind of show him how it works and he could actually be doing it himself and who knows where that would lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that's probably what I would say to most people who complain about them. They're like, I don't know why they would do it. You're not the intended audience. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of these companies, including ourselves, when we bring them in, we have a rough target of who we're trying to talk to with a product. And a lot of people, when a new product gets announced, It'll go on certain forum websites and get shredded apart. Good chance it probably wasn't for you, but thanks for your thoughts. So, <laughs> Yeah, and you know it's coming too when it's like these type of imagers are going to see it through in this light. Yeah. Whereas but it's just not for you. Yeah. I also think too, it's like there's this, you know, I had to do this huge struggle to like get through the hobby and, you know, get over all these hurdles to get here. And now it's a lot easier for people. I don't know if there's some like animosity there in terms it's of like, I didn't have to do that. So it should be hard for you too. But yeah. I think making it more welcoming and open to people only. It's, it's only, we're only going to see more of that too, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's only be getting more, um, you know, widespread and approachable for, mm -hmm. for the every everyday person. I guess at the end of the day, you know, taking my competitive thoughts from being in a company, as long as it gets people into the hobby and encourages understanding of the universe and mm -hmm. with Ash, you know, protecting dark skies. It's great. I don't care what you have at mm -hmm. the end of the day. So, yeah um there's a bunch of questions in here how do you choose between a unique object slash rarely photographed or something that is common or more general public i mean it, uh, like for beginners getting into it I, I i actually recommend going after the easier brighter <laughs> targets you know i i mean ash isn't there's still some mega targets you've yeah. never photographed before and you're gonna go you've never done the trifid nebula so i've never done Oh, right. Like, um, the Omega Nebula I've never done. Yeah. So like yeah. those are on your list. And as you cross those off, and then if you're like me, you're, you, you photographed it, but you're not happy with it. So you keep <laughs> doing it until you get it the way you want it. And then you get to more of the obscure stuff. So I feel like when you see people doing these like LDN catalog objects, there's a good chance they've been at this for a while where they've, they've been through the Messier catalog. And so, yeah, I think it's it makes a lot of sense to go after the the, the showstopper mm -hmm. stuff early on in your journey I think, and then to yeah. get from there for me as a beginner to uh, the processing side of doing something that's a little more obscure is a little intimidating i sure. find some of the brighter crowd pleaser targets are i think generally going to be easier to process than something that's really dim and dark so i'm staying in my lane until i can improve that part of my astrophotography to then move yeah, on. And you should think about what your equipment can do best too. Certain things just don't make sense where, whether you need more aperture, um, you know, if it's visual or, or photography where, where you should be using uh, narrow band filters and a monochrome camera and stuff. So do what your, your gear is best at as well. Mm. 
you know, just end up frustrated because you didn't, you know, get it. It's like, well, maybe that wasn't the best setup for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Ashley used the Star Adventure GTI at Starfest. What are, I jumped here. What are her thoughts on it? Beginner friendly, track 12? Yes and yes. Very beginner friendly. Um, I'm still working on kind of finding targets, I guess. Oh, no, I'm thinking of the Star Adventure because yeah. I use that at Cherry Springs. The GTI, no, yes. GTI, very beginner friendly because it does have the go to function. And, and um, I, from day one, we've used it with the yeah. ASI Air too. So it just talks to each other so seamlessly. Mm -hmm that, you know, it plate solves and finds objects through the app. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, to me, I've since since it first arrived, I thought of it as a mini EQ six, it just does everything mm -hmm. a full fledged larger EQ mount does in this tiny package. Yeah, well, yeah. And you have, you have the GTI, you have the EQ six R, or you have your HEQ five, the EQ six R, the CQ thrifty, and the eight R. And I'm sure it's you can literally unplug the whole setup and apply to all of all of them. Seriously, in in that there's something to be there's something beautiful about that. So the the Skywatcher HEQ5, and you know how old that mount is, the original gold and black one, that was our first Skywatcher mount, and the overall experience really has not changed all the way through the late the CQ350, mm -hmm. which is great. And I mean, we used to use the hand controller and the SIN scan and everything, and now using it with the ASI Air is just they're they're pretty well bulletproof and I, mm -hmm. everybody knows it <laughs> no and that was the nice part about because i'm confusing the two star parties at cherry springs they use the two i oh, third right. two i and i did have a little bit of trouble kind of okay finding my target and framing it up and all of that but yeah get the G gti it was a beautiful thing uh let's see are you doing more processing and pics in sight will there ever be a day when you completely switch from photoshop or is there a benefit to using both processing approaches? There's definitely a benefit to using both. Um, I mean, that's not to be said that you couldn't create a beautiful image using either program standalone. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, I, I put off using Pix and Sight because I was so comfortable with, with Photoshop and there wasn't anything I felt like I couldn't do until, you know, I was showed a, a few tutorials of certain things that Pix and Sight not not just did better, but did faster and easier. Um, so yeah, it's there's a lot to learn in Pix and Sight. And for anyone that's you know that came from where I was, where they just love Photoshop and are avoiding Pix and Sight, now there are so many great tutorials on YouTube for Pix and Sight. Even if you just start applying a few new things here and there, it, it'll be become a part of your workflow, and it definitely is a part of mine now. Not to the point where I, I feel like I could teach it to anyone, um, maybe eventually, but there's a lot to learn. Yeah, I jump between the two as well, and Pix and Sight's a bit of a monster. I know people who do it all in there, but it's a monster of a program. Yeah. Um, what's one non-astrophotography slash astronomy related item you should bring during star parties? <laughs> Non astrophotography. A blanket. I was gonna say warm, oh, warm clothes. <clears throat> because the second you get too cold, it like infiltrates your body and you just can't stay out anymore. Yeah. You like guys it, like froze in Texas the night we left you there. I came back and you guys were like this. <laughs> it's <laughs> always colder than you think it's gonna be. Yes. And even if it says it's you know, gonna be, you know, mild temperature, it's gonna feel a lot colder when you're standing there all night. Well, and it gets really like Cherry Springs and Starfest, same kind of climate and weather. It gets really dewy at night and yeah. really damp and cold. And that I brought cuts winter, through yeah, everything. I brought winter boots this year to Cherry Springs and I did not regret it. And yeah, I needed them. Always over prepare yeah. for clothes and hopefully you just won't need it, but you'll be glad that you, once my feet are cold, same, yeah. done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't care how good the skies are i'm done yep. so thanks for coming <laughs> um any plans to witness the annual eclipse in the southwest no we'll probably just look at the the partial from here um i mean just a small little bite uh, but we don't have plans to travel to see that one we're thinking obviously next year the main event we're we're traveling for that one mm-hmm 
Yeah, if you don't have your stuff figured out for April 8th next year, you better get on it right now. Do not wait. I highly recommend, if you're here in the U.S., the best deal that we have found and where Skywatcher is going is Texas Star Party's Eclipse event, mm -hmm. which is out near Waco, Texas. They have, it's an amazing package. It's like 2800 bucks for like four or five nights. And that includes two people in a room and food. So mm -hmm. honestly, you won't find any. And it's Bortal 4, I think. So very good. Yeah. But yeah. I think there's maybe a few spots I've read at the event where we're going um, still available, but that's out in New Brunswick um, in a small little town. So we'll be there. Same kind of deal. It's like an all-inclusive type of event for lodging and food and fun stuff during the day, like yoga and bird photography. And so they're kind of making it this kind of holistic type of event. So that's cool. But yeah, don't, don't wait it's and try not to travel on the day of the eclipse either just do the eclipse <laughs> and then sit because everyone and their mom is going to be like we're going to go home and then you're going to be stuck for hours while the rest of us are have our feet up and being like wasn't that cool yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> but after doing 2017 just don't don't plan to travel on that day just take it in because you're gonna be blown away and leave on Tuesday like you'll thank yourself later um that we already did this but what was your favorite part of Starfest what about it makes you want to go back <laughs> yeah there's a I mean yeah there's a bunch oh, of things so there's I guess maybe it's all good star parties but there's people that have been, been coming there for 30 years so uh and then there's some people that you know just going there two years now we know we're going to see them there every year and they're friends that we're going to see once a year so you kind of feel like they're expecting you so yeah the, the the group of people that we've been hanging out with when we get there it's kind of like see you next year you know mm -hmm. that's kind of what i think of when i think of starfest yeah it's kind of like a little bit of a family vibe when you finally start going a couple of years in a row it's like you just kind of know the crew mm -hmm. and who's the regulars and it's like yeah that's hey how's it going how's your year been blah 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 blah. you know it's the whole thing when you spend time with someone at a star party it's like you're kind of have that special little connection for life it's like we talked at four in the morning in the pitch black we couldn't see each other for like three hours like we're close now <laughs> yes and meeting someone for the first time at a star party in the dark is always funny because then it's like it's just a voice daytime it's like oh my god okay that that was you okay like I, yep. had, you know i just remember will from uh oh, yeah. texas star party his voice is so recognizable and i was yeah. like oh i didn't see you in person but that's what you look like okay it's like meeting them all over again <laughs> yeah. yeah will's funny like that because he's almost like a genie you just kind of rub the lamp and poof <laughs> will is suddenly oh, there yeah. and there's his voice and it's and... a hell of a voice too he's like yeah. a radio, has like a radio yeah. host, host voice and you can hear him wherever he is in the star party <laughs> I think we're going to have him on next month as our guest. I think if that's correct, Deep Sky Dude, and talk yeah. about like his music and all the stuff cool. that he does. And, we'll but that'll be cool. Mm -hmm. Will's cool. If you haven't met Will, he's usually at Oki Tex and Texas Star Party. But go check out Deep Sky Dude and his music on like Apple Music and stuff. It's If you're looking for something atmospheric, it's quite good. Um, and actually buy his stuff to support him. It's not that much, but support him yeah uh let's see we have five minutes left i see a lot of scopes back there and no dollies how do you move your equipment well we all know that ashley's just a jedi and she uses the force but you know <laughs> my back somehow has made it 39 years and still in one piece it lifted a lot of rigs even after falling uh so yeah taking things apart helps a lot um nothing's heavier than you know it's a counterweight at a time a tripod at a time or the smaller rigs the whole thing comes out yeah i sh we should really get some wheelie carts <laughs> i don't know how we've gone this long without one well you guys it, it's all tile and then tile to the concrete it's right very, it's flat so we could just wheel it right out i've seen people get i think they're at like home depot or something like that but they get these big like three wheeled casters mm -hmm. and yes. then they just pick up a tripod leg and they just pop it in there and you just that way you can roll any particular one out you don't need like a custom right. bar to do it so 
Yeah. Oh, so directly to the tripod leg then. Oh no, it just like you like a CQ three fifty, oh. pull the leg up, pop it under the foot, and oh, then I see. slides it. You got, yeah, and you got it rolling. That's cool. There's always someone's gonna come up with something, but mm. Ashley's still a Jedi yeah. and she uses the force. Yeah. But yeah. <clears throat> um, so that's pretty close to it for it. You guys wanna add anything about um attending Ontario Starfest next year or shout out mm -hmm. to anything out there? Registration opened this year in May. So if you are thinking about going um, to Starfest, <coughs> keep your eyes peeled for registration around then. Um, it fills up quick too if you have like an RV and a trailer. The trailer yeah. section sold out in two days this year. Um, so that was the first. For last year we had a trailer spot. This year we did not have a trailer spot. So we couldn't use power. We couldn't plug in our RV this year. So yeah, keep an eye out in in mid-May if you're serious about coming to the star party for registration and get in there and and get it done just to get your spot yeah yeah don't don't wait for these um especially on some of these star parties um like the larger ones because usually they have a little bit of a limited space and if you need something specialized like a trailer or you hook up some stuff like that a lot of times these sites don't have a lot of infrastructure so it's it's quite limited so register as soon as possible if you know you want to go yeah that's with any star party by the way but. yeah that's true well cool i don't see any other questions floating around um but if you guys want to check out uh star fest i will bring they haven't opened up obviously it just ended um but uh here's star fest website um you can just Google it too, because the it looks like this is kind of a weird. It's the nyaa.ca and all that fun stuff there. So, there, just Google Ontario Starfest. Um, oh, look, they have the dates up already. Um, August eighth through the eleventh, twenty twenty four. So, um, there you go. At least mark your calendars right. for it. Um, but yeah, as Ash was saying, May is when they open it up. So. If you want to go and you need something particular, do make sure you jump on that or any star party. Once registration opens, particularly if you need something special, don't wait to the last minute. Well, right on. Thank you guys very much. Uh, we always appreciate having you on and thanks for talking Starfest. Um, like I said, if you guys want to go next year, it's definitely a worthwhile event. I hope to be there next year. Um, and especially if you're in Canada, it's kind of that is the event so go head over there represent and um other than that we'll be on next week uh for what's up webcast for what's up in the nighttime sky we're going to talk about the new totem target um good luck and um yeah i hope you guys have a great weekend overall and thanks trevor and ash for joining us thanks, thanks for having us. us thanks everybody cool. we'll see you guys next week clear skies um go look at the well, Harvest Moon was last night, but you can still go out and look at it tonight. And uh, we'll see you guys next Friday. Take care, clear skies, and have a good one. Bye.